You're washing your hair again? Didn't you just wash it yesterday? Yeah, but I saw in a magazine that your hair is dirty if you don't shampoo it every day. Okay, let me pretend I understand how magazines and capitalism work. Was it an ad? Well, yeah. For a shampoo company? I think so. That makes more money if you use up more shampoo? Well, I guess, but wouldn't they know what they're talking about since they make shampoo? Look, I'm used to feudalism and I can see what's wrong with this picture. My least favorite hair care myth from back in my professional hairstylist days is that hair should be washed daily, and I am quite pleased to see this attitude starting to die out. But as a fashion history nerd, what I'm really curious about is, after centuries upon centuries of washing hair weekly, or monthly, or never, how and why did we end up with this myth in the first place? Hi, I'm V. Now that I'm not doing hair anymore, I like to get on the internet and chatter about fashion history, especially when I can use all the stuff I learned at my old job. I cannot count the number of times my clients would come in, sit down in my chair, and then apologize to me that their hair was dirty because they hadn't washed it that day, even though I was about to wash it for them. If you like hair myths, you should subscribe now because next month I promise to insult like half the Bay Area by talking about Viking hair. The stuff we know as shampoo is only about 100 years old, and that refers to a very specific kind of bubbly hair care product, and it's far from the only hair cleaning method out there. Surfactants, which are the stuff that makes bubbly cleaning products of all varieties work, have existed in various forms for millennia. Soap, probably the best known of these, existed in France from the 4th century, and it was sometimes used for hair washing. A physician from Constantinople named Theodorus Priscianus says the Franks had a soap they used to wash their heads. For more info on why you would not want to wash your head or any other part of your person with lower quality medieval soap, uh, click up here. In other parts of the world, different types of surfactants were used depending on natural resources. I've read of quinoa saponins used in South America, sapindus or soap nuts being used in South Asia, and gugo in the Philippines. Outside of washing with water and surfactant, hair was kept clean through a combination of brushing or combing, braiding, and clean head coverings such as the linen caps and veils worn in medieval Europe. I only wash my hair weekly, and while I mostly use modern curly hair methods, having linen pillowcases from Book Linen has definitely helped my hair feel clean for the full week. I actually just got something new from their sister brand, Marlo, a pillow brand designed to help you sleep better. Right now, you can buy two Marlo pillows and save 25%, or buy four pillows and save 40% with my link below. So. Y'all probably know by now that I have serious chronic neck pain and an unfortunate tendency to injure myself in my sleep because of it. I've tried all sorts of normal and ergonomic pillows and there's nothing that's been comfortable for me all the time. It just changes too much. I would have to switch out pillows before bed or in the middle of the night. I figured anything that was Brooklinen's level of quality was worth a try and these pillows have not let me down. My favorite part is that you can make the pillow firmer or softer by zipping it or unzipping it here. So if my neck issues need something different, I don't have to grab a whole different pillow or even worse, take out the filling like some other adjustable pillows. The filling is is chopped cooling infused memory foam, so there's a great balance of support without the sort of too solid pressure that can set off my fibromyalgia. I am pleased to report there have been zero sleep induced injuries since I got these pillows. And maybe this is coincidence, but I've also had a lot more good hair days, or I've just slept well enough to actually do my hair in the morning. Either way, it's a win for my weekly washing routine. The word shampoo did not enter the English language until around 1814, thanks to a Bengali fellow named Dean Mahomed, who ran a bathhouse in Brighton offering steam baths and other medical spa treatments. The word shampoo was an anglicization of the Hindi word champi, referring to therapeutic massage. How exactly the word shampoo went from meaning massage therapy to hair washing product is less clear. It could have something to do with massaging the scalp when washing the hair, which my hairdresser self wishes to remind you that you should always do, or the herbs and essential oils that Mahomet's treatments used, but there's still quite a gap in my information there. This coincided with both the decline of 18th century style hair powder and some major improvements to soap making that meant hair washing was a much more attractive option. English cosmetologist Andrew Pears developed a glycerin soap in 1807, which could be produced on an industrial scale, although it should be noted that his company used extremely racist advertising to promote it. 
Throughout the 19th century, these newer, gentler soaps could be either used on their own to wash hair or as part of more complex recipes. In 1889, Ella Rodman Church recommends combining egg yolk with half a teacup of ammonia, a tablespoon each of oil of bergamot and melted toilette soap, a teaspoon of powdered borax, and a quart of rainwater. She then emphasizes that this is for a monthly washing of the scalp. Frequent washing injures the young growth. Brushing was still considered a more appropriate daily cleaning method. Good Housekeeping magazine says, once a fortnight is enough to wash well-brushed hair, despite the charms Amelie Reeves pictures of a woman's hair daily washed. The Delineator in 1894 offers a much simpler recipe of Castile soap savings dissolved in warm water to be used once monthly. Even into the early 20th century, it was believed one of the greatest mistakes of most women and men is to wash the hair of the head too frequently. So then the 1920s rolled in and changed everything. So much of the modern hairdressing craft is based on methods developed in the 1920s because the change was so drastic. The default fashionable hairstyle went from long hair pinned up in some way to short bobbed hair. These shorter cuts needed washing more often for reasons of cleanliness, since there's less hair to absorb natural oils and pinning up is no longer an option, and for styling, either so the hair could be wet set into curled shapes like finger waves, or to remove the heavy gels and styling products used to create those curled and set styles. Even people who kept their long hair would often use similar styling methods for updos that mimic the shortcuts. During this period, the weekly wash and style became an institution, and hair salons found themselves with much more business as work that was previously done by domestic servants like ladies' maids was instead brought to them. Shampoo itself also changed quite a bit around this time. As well as plain soap and homemade preparations, by the turn of the 20th century, you could buy shampoo mixes with soap flakes, herbs, and other ingredients combined and ready for use. In the year 1900, German cosmetologist Josef William Rausch began selling a liquid hair washing soap to go with the herbal hair care tonics he already produced. In 1927, the company founded by Hans Schwarzkopf and run by his wife Martha made improvements to soap-based shampoo for better mass production. You may recognize his name because the company is still manufacturing hair care products today. Dreen, developed in the 1930s, was the first non-soap shampoo made using synthetic surfactants. This is the product we think of as shampoo today, specifically made for washing hair and chemically different from soap and other kinds of detergents. My curly hair viewers will recognize this as the much feared sulfate we work so hard to avoid. General Western hair care practices continued much in the same way through the 1950s, and weekly washing and setting was used to create the changing fashionable hairstyles. It should be understood that this was not the absolute universal way that every person cared for their hair. Just like in any other period, you had societal default expectations and individual people followed them or not to varying degrees. Of course, then we had another cultural revolution that changed everything yet again in the 1960s. I should probably preface all of this by saying that the 60s and 70s are, aesthetically speaking, very much not my thing. Here I am diving into a period of fashion history that I have previously never touched because social norms and hair care are interesting enough to me to set aside my own visual sensibilities. In short, several changes to fashionable hair care and styling in the 60s broke the default expectation of a weekly wash and set cycle. The primly fitted dresses of the 50s gave way to less constructed silhouettes like this, and the neatly set and structured curls of fashionable 50s hairstyles is gave way to both longer, looser shapes and even shorter structured haircuts like this. The hippie movement of the later 1960s made loose, unstructured hairstyles even more popular. Styling methods were certainly still used, but that default expectation of a weekly wash and set was falling apart. Those shorter pixie cuts pretty much had to be washed every day or so to keep them sitting nicely. And yes, this is bringing me back to five years of clients coming in and telling me they want a pixie cut because it'll be no work, and me having to explain that no, having a pixie cut look like this takes more work than my hair. This all coincided with the invention of what I must admit is my least favorite hairstyling method out there. The Blowout, invented in 1962 when Jewish hairstylist Rose Ivansky, of blessed, albeit frustrated on behalf of Jewish curly girls everywhere memory, saw a barber using a handheld dryer and brush to style a short haircut. 
I wore myself out explaining why this is not great for your hair at my old job, so if that's something you're curious about, Hair YouTube can probably help with that. The important bit as far as hair washing norms is that unlike earlier setting methods, a blowout pretty much has to start with washing the hair. I also asked on Instagram for anecdotes from my followers who were around in the 60s and 70s. It's so strange to be researching a time where I can talk to people who lived through it and heard that even some folks who were roller setting their hair were washing and setting more frequently because the fashionable styles simply didn't hold up well for as long. Once a week styling is not going to cut it if you want your hair to look like this all the time. Now that the once a week expectation was broken, the floodgates were basically open for hair product companies to take advantage. Don't get me wrong, I am not saying that every single new hair product was a scheme to make us buy unnecessary stuff. I am quite pleased at the invention of such wonderful things as hair conditioning in 1970. It's the tone of the marketing that I think affected our views. Moving into the 70s, the fashion was for fluffy, shiny, voluminous, big, soft hair to go with the big or soft look fashions and clothes. Instead of ads just telling you, our shampoo will give you the biggest, softest hair ever, the ads are telling you something is wrong with the hair you currently have. You should be afraid your hair will look limp and dull and greasy. How gross! You'll have to wash it more so it's clean and shiny. Isn't your hair the nicest right after you've washed it, when it's so clean each strand of hair flows free without clinging to its neighbor? This shampoo is gentle enough you can wash it every night. See? It says so in the brand name. Maybe you have dandruff. You should be worried about having dandruff, and you aren't, says the leading manufacturer of dandruff shampoo to this day. This one in particular is a trip. There's just so many levels of messaging here. Wouldn't it be nice to wash your hair every day? How important frequent washing is to clean hair? How other shampoos will ruin your hair if you use them often enough? So of course the solution is to buy this shampoo instead of, say, washing your hair less often. Because then your hair wouldn't be clean. Daily shampooing did not automatically become the norm for everyone. The wonderful muse of Muse and Dionysus was kind enough to ask their mom about her natural hair care routine in the 60s. Mama Muse described washing her hair every two weeks and wearing braids and ponytails in between, or having her hair hot combed for special occasions. However, that did not stop advertisers from targeting natural haired folks with daily shampoo messaging. They just changed their wording a bit. So what's the lesson here? Never underestimate the willingness or ability of marketing to make up a problem so it can sell you the solution. The number one goal of advertising is to get you to buy something. And for quite a while, making people feel ashamed and inadequate has been a very effective way to do so. Your unwashed hair is dirty, so buy more shampoo. Your hair is dry from too much shampooing, so buy conditioner. Your hair isn't voluminous enough, so buy hairspray. And so on. It's capitalism at its finest. And by finest, I mean willing to swear such things as truth and self-esteem and good sense by the wayside. What frustrates me even more is that this same marketing is also driving the movement away from daily shampooing. Shampoo is too drying, so you should buy co-wash and dry shampoo instead. I am very, very happy to live in a time and place where we are spoiled for choice when it comes to hair care products. You can find something these days for just about every texture of hair and every lifestyle a person might have. But I am not pleased about the amount of shaming and misinformation that remains in beauty industry marketing, or the power it has. Take it from a trained professional hairstylist. Do not believe what you see in beauty product ads because it's not required to be truthful and it pretty much never has been. I do really love these moments where I get to use my hairdresser credentials for fashion history study. Tell me in the comments about either your favorite or least favorite advertising field myth. And while you're there, why not click the like button and subscribe for more hair history? Thanks again to Marlo for sponsoring this video. I promise you no problems needed to be invented to make me want pillows this comfy and versatile? Click the link in the description to get 25% off two pillows or 40% off four pillows. At least when I do insult half the Bay Area next month talking about Viking hair, it'll be on a full night's sleep. Fine, go ahead, dry your hair out by shampooing it every day. See if I care. Well, I guess it's fine that your hair's so dirty because nobody ever sees it anyways.